At the end of your audio signal path in the schematic, you need to send your audio channels out of the QSIS environment to be delivered to a loudspeaker so that you can, you know, hear it. There are a number of ways to accomplish this, and certain options definitely have their advantages over others. One of the best methods is to use a native QSIS network amplifier, which you can add to your design just like any other QSIS peripheral. These native amplifiers have been specifically designed to work with the QSIS ecosystem, so you can benefit from easy plug-and-play integration, and you can sleep well knowing that they've been thoroughly vetted and tested to deliver power, telemetry, and remote control monitoring for all QSIS systems. You can add one from the inventory panel in the amplifier category. At the time of this video, you can see the CXDQ and CXQ series of amplifiers, which have a network port to receive your audio channels. Like any QC peripheral, it has a status component that lets you monitor the device's health, but this also has an amp out component that represents its physical outputs. Certain models might even have input components as well. For amplifiers that offer local inputs to get a couple more channels into your QSIS environment and distribute them anywhere in your system. Regardless of which model you use, sending audio to that amplifier is as easy as populating the audio pins of its amp output component. However, don't forget to tell the amplifier what kind of loudspeaker you're using, too. This left facing triangle pin can only be wired to a matching pin found on a loudspeaker component. In your inventory panel, you can select from a wide range of QSE loudspeakers to add to your design. Just keep in mind that these loudspeakers aren't network devices, so you have to actually physically wire the cables from the amplifier to the loudspeaker in the real world, too. So, if that's the case, you may be wondering, why do I have to virtually wire them in the software? Well, doing this tells the amplifier everything it needs to know about the loudspeaker it's driving. In particular, if you're using a QSC loudspeaker, you'll take advantage of QSC's intrinsic correction technology, which automatically voices your QSC loudspeaker to the best sonic performance and takes advantage of thousands of different measurements and countless hours of QSC testing. If you're not using QSC loudspeakers, you could instead add a generic speaker component. We'll look at that scenario a little later in this video. An alternative to using network QSC amplifiers would be to use a legacy data port enabled QSC amplifier, which can be connected to your QSIS system through a data port I.O. card installed in select core models. In this setup, you would use a QSC data port cable to connect your I.O. card to the amplifier in the real world, and then make that same connection in the software using these right facing data port pins. You'll notice that data port enabled amplifiers can only receive audio via these data port pins, unlike the standard audio pins available on a networked amplifier. Do note that a single data port connection actually carries two audio channels. If you hover your mouse over the first pin, you'll notice that it carries input channels one and two, and the second carries input channels three and four. The connections even look different. It has two lines to remind you that it has two channels. So be sure to wire two audio channels into the data port I.O. card for each data port connection to your amplifier. It's quite possible, however, to use a QSC amplifier that is neither networked nor data port enabled. For instance, the SPA series and the MPA series are amplifiers with analog only inputs. For devices like these, QSIS can't monitor the amplifier or the audio signal once it leaves the analog output. So as far as your design is concerned, the line out component is the end of the line. In the real world, you'd obviously wire your line out channels to the amplifier and then your amplifier to the loudspeaker. However, what if you don't want to miss out on all that great intrinsic correction that you get by using a QSC loudspeaker? You clearly can't wire this loudspeaker with the left facing triangle pins to an output that doesn't have the same connection, can you? The solution is to go to your loudspeaker's properties and change the inline processing field to yes. This converts your loudspeaker's components to a pass-through object with both a standard audio input pin and output pin. You can then wire your audio through this component just before your line out channel, which will apply all of the appropriate tunings for your QSE loudspeaker. It may seem counterintuitive that the loudspeaker is placed before the output channel inside QSIS, but keep in mind that this component doesn't actually represent the physical loudspeaker itself. 
It simply represents the custom voicing you want to apply to your signal that is tailored for that loudspeaker. All right, now let's talk about the dreaded final scenario. Whether you're using a QSC native amplifier, a data port enabled amplifier, or an analog output channel, it's possible that you might be using a non-QSC loudspeaker. Personally, I can't think of a single situation where that would be advisable. Nope, not one. But let's walk through that process anyway in case you've been forced to do something like this. As I showed you earlier, you can add a generic speaker component to your design to represent this speaker in any of the three methods that we talked about, since it also has the option to use inline processing for the analog output. You'll also want to add a custom voicing component, which you'll find in your inventory, which is where you can add all of the tuning data for that loudspeaker. Be sure to direct your generic loudspeaker to use this custom voicing in its properties. This is done to make it easier on you. You can input your loudspeaker data in one single place and then direct multiple generic speaker components to use that same data with a single click. In fact, if you need to make an adjustment later on, that single change will automatically be applied to every generic speaker that is assigned to reference that custom voicing block. But as far as making things easy on you, that's kind of where it ends. Because now comes the hard part of finding that tuning data. You'll need to consult your loudspeaker spec sheet or their website, or sometimes hound the manufacturer directly to get that tuning information. And unfortunately, every manufacturer is going to list that information in a different way, and frankly, you may not find it at all. Once you have all that data, you'll want to use it to populate all of the properties in your generic speaker component. For a loudspeaker with multiple bands, be sure to adjust the band count and then input the required information for each of these bands. You'll want to make the same band count adjustments on the custom voicing block, and it wouldn't be a bad idea to name the component to, just so you know what you're referring to. Let's open the custom voicing control panel and walk you through an example of inputting some of this data. Here's some information that we found on speaker X from manufacturer Y. Why? Why not? We can't see this in design mode, so let's go ahead and enter emulation mode. Each band has a lot of different information to fill out. You just need to be patient and find the right information. The first band is our LF, which we can see in our first column. You don't need to change the gain from zero. We set the delay to 0.18 milliseconds, and we keep the polarity at normal. On the high pass, the frequency is 62.5 hertz with a Butterworth slope of 18. And the low pass, the frequency is 1.0 kilohertz with a Butterworth frequency of 18 as well. Now pay close attention to this. This is really important. These pink bypass buttons are active, which means that all of the information you just entered is being completely ignored. By default, everything in the custom voicing block is inactive, so you have to choose which element you want to use. So I will deactivate the bypass buttons, which makes our crossover data now active. The same is true in our voicing filters. These buttons on the left are bypass buttons, and once again, every filter defaults to being bypassed. The first thing you have to do is deactivate the bypass so that your voicing filter data will be used. I know it sort of looks like you're turning a filter off by turning off a button, but just remember that you're turning off the bypass, which means that you're making the filter active. All right, let's add this data. The first filter has a gain of negative 2.4 dB, a frequency of 4 to 1 hertz, and a width of, uh-oh, now look what we have here. You have to input the frequency range width as an octave ratio, but sometimes you may receive the information in iterations of Q rather than octave width. But don't fret, you can easily search for a Q converter online and input the Q number to receive the octave equivalent. Now our low frequency band is complete. You would repeat this process for a high frequency band, and you'll notice that this one uses two parametric EQ, so you would have to activate a second parametric curve on that band and input the info for both of them. Yes, it takes a while and it's kind of frustrating. Kind of feels like a good reason to stay with the native QSIS ecosystem. I'm just saying. We'll see you next time.